So just to keep it very simple here, we have three choices when it comes to defending our gun rights. If you want to have your gun rights defended, okay. if you want to have an end to police brutality because people have more guns, and by the way, also ending qualified immunity, which holds the police accountable when they do brutalize everyone. Yeah. If you want that, you have three choices. You have Donald Trump, who's one of the biggest uh, cheerleaders for the police state, and who occasionally talks a good game when it comes to, to gun control, when he's not busy pushing for bu uh, bump stock bans and gun accessory bans and yeah. red flag laws. And then you have Joe Biden, who doesn't even try to talk a good game about guns. He is proposing massive gun control when he's not pushing for continuation of his 50-year history of the militarized police state and civil asset forfeiture and a completely out of control, increasingly unaccountable police state. Again, when he's not, you took my line, when he's not busy sniffing children. And, <laughs> and his newly minted running mate, who again, you took my line, locked up more black people than almost any other person living right now. She did. She sure did. And then the next choice that you have is Joe Jorgensen, yeah. who is going to end the war on guns, and who's also going to end the war on drugs, and end qualified immunity, and end civil asset forfeiture, and end no-knock raids, and end yes. cash bail, yeah. and end minimum, uh, mandatory minimum sentencing, yes. and dismantle the policies of systemic racism that have led to the harmful and inequitable and abusive outcomes that we often see. And that starts with allowing you to defend yourself by ending the war on guns. So I hope everyone here recognizes that they only have one viable choice when it comes to demonstrating, truly demonstrating, that black lives matter. And that is Joe Jorgensen. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, if anything, we'll, we'll give you some new guns. No, 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 there's no, there's no buybacks. No, there's none of that. No, all gun laws end. The, the NFA, every any any law that is on the books is an infringement on your natural right to protect and defend yourself and your loved ones and your communities as you see fit. It is no no one in that building or this building business what kind of gun you have. That's right. 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 I can carry this in the military, but I can't carry it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we did receive a text message from Mr. Maj. He would not be able to make it due to some plane issues, but he did say that he will be putting out a statement, let him know that we weren't selling whoop tickets and we were rescheduling. So we apologize to anybody who may have came, strictly off the sole purposes of meeting him. Um, but like I said we were are committed, like I said we we're 100% truthful, and I just want to let that be known. Um, we definitely still appreciate everybody for coming out, and we will be doing this more often. We try to get every quarter, every month, um, however often we all feel mobilized. Everybody, who all is from here from Richmond? 757? Ooh. Somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> Do that again. I, hold on, I gotta record that. <laughs> hold on. Give me a minute. <laughs> so again, who all do we have here from Richmond? 757? Other places? That's you. And this is where it starts. A small pocket. Y'all know uh, Nat Turner's Rebellion. Um, I really wish Maj was here because he spoke something to me to open my eyes up to things, and that was the Bacon's Rebellion that I wasn't very familiar with, but um, seeing him out here when they first started putting together the gun bullshit um, before Lobby Day, when they had initially, you know, the moms and man, uh, angry yelling was here and all that was happening, uh, when I first had the opportunity to meet Maj, and just know that everybody here is standing on the right side of history. Don't let nobody tell y'all otherwise. Don't, it's already obvious, but don't let nobody make y'all think that you're less of whoever because, you know, they have the stereotypes of people with big trucks, stereotypes of people with big guns. Well, just like they don't want people body shaming, stop truck shaming people. Stop gun shaming people. <laughs> like, seriously, because, like, because people choose to live their life how they want to, stop judging them. They want everybody to have equality until it's something that they don't agree with. Yep. Then it's like, oh, well, not maybe not so much that. Yep. A little less that. 
but equality still, a little less that. So with that being said, I mean, I don't have any other words. Like I say, I encourage everybody to network, get everybody social media. I'm Jafar757, uh, BLM757 on Instagram and Twitter. And everybody else, let's just, like I say, congregate. I don't know if y'all want to march, I'm a little hungry. <laughs> <laughs> We're not here for a If anyone has any questions about any of the other policies that Joe and I have, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. And it doesn't have to be like in this kind of format. You can just come up to me and ask me. I'd be happy to answer it. And I appreciate it. I'll be here for a while, and I appreciate everyone's time. Thank All right, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They just picked someone and said, no, nah, well, she's black and she's a woman, so that should be enough. Looking at her actual record. Mm -hmm. Look at her track record. She's done more damage to us. Yes, she has. Yeah. I mean, since Clinton. <laughs> well, and, and keep on, you know, when Bill Clinton was in office, do you know what he was enforcing? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. 1994. Joe Biden. And, and I'm not giving any, any slack to Republicans because they were the ones who lined up to help, mm -hmm. to help sign that. And it was plenty of Republican administrations since then. It was Bush and now Trump that are enforcing it. They're all in on it. Joe Biden picking Kamala Harris is like the equivalent of when uh, Nancy Pelosi put on that kente cloth. Right. Went and kneeled down in the lobby of the Capitol building and then got right back up and didn't do a damn thing right. to actually address what the protesters right. were saying. They weren't saying to, you know, do some, some cosplay for us, some Black Panther cosplay. They were saying, go and actually make changes so that our lives aren't being threatened by the state that you created. Right. And they did nothing to right. protect. Well, see, the fact that, that when Biden came out, the fact that I've never seen Obama out there like going crazy. That was your ride or die for right. eight years. Yep. Why isn't Obama screaming your your praises at the top of the building? Why he even go up there? You know what I'm saying? That that right there gave me some red That's flags telling. right off the bat. That's right there. In 2015, Obama referred to them as thugs. 2014 or 2015, one of those years, he referred to them as thugs. Now keep in mind, he wasn't trying to get reelected. He was a lame duck. He could have said whatever he wanted. He called them thugs. Oh, he was talking about the protesters, the, the hands up, don't shoot protesters. So, yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I'm happy. Anyone has any questions or anything else, I'll be happy to answer. All skip folk ain't kids, folk, man. I'll let you say that. All right. All right. <laughs> cool. Thank you, brother. So, you are uh, in support of, obviously, of defunding? I'm just picking at you now. At the federal oh. level, we will defund the police. Yes. The federal government should never gotten involved with policing. And we saw what happened as a result of it. Feds got involved in policing, and now what are the police? Militarized and out of control. And that's the problem. Tear gas, rubber bullets, and more important than that, qualified immunity. Now, y'all have probably heard of this, and maybe maybe some of you don't know what qualified immunity is, or you've only gotten a basic understanding of what it is. Imagine if you could go to court and say, Your Honor, I know I've been accused of murder. I think what I did was perfectly <coughs> reasonable. And the judge goes, oh, okay, well then I'll throw the charges out. That's essentially qualified immunity. Mm -hmm. Qualified immunity is an absurd legal doctrine that the Supreme Court made out of thin air that says that if uh, a police officer or government agent infringes upon the rights of an American, of a person, that they can't be held liable for that if they decide what they did was reasonable. That is the, that is the baseline there, that if they decide what they did was reasonable, then they basically get off scot-free. They don't have to get in any trouble. And we see how that plays out. Derek Chauvin, the man who murdered George Floyd, murder. he had 17 other complaints against him, mm. including wrongful death charges. For all we know, and thanks to qualified immunity, we don't know, for all we know, he may have murdered other people. Right. And when the Minneapolis Police Department looked at Derek Chauvin, 
they made the same cost-benefit analysis that police departments and government agencies around the country make when they look at the bad apples in their bunch. They looked at him and said, this cop is terrible, he needs to go, but we aren't going to be able to get rid of him. It will cost us a fortune fighting the police unions, and we can just keep him on the force. He's not costing us anything because of qualified immunity. We can't get sued, and he can't get sued. So we'll just keep him on the force. He'll eventually go so far that we can just throw him in jail, and then he'll be off the force. Right. So then what's your idea about combating the police unions? And obviously, they're going to have a large say in how they, on how you sway the judgment of the police departments and how you build that. How you demilitarize them or how you ever go about them. How do you plan on combating whatever kind of um, backlash that you may face from those unions? That the beauty of ending qualified immunity is that it also works on them too, because they don't want to get sued either. You put the power back in the hands of the people, and now when a Derek Chauvin shows up and is abusing people and infringing upon their rights, now not only does the police department want to get rid of him as quickly as possible because he is costing, going to potentially cost them money in lawsuits, the police unions who also don't want to get sued are also pushing to get rid of them. Right. There's plenty of problems with police unions. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but specifically on this issue, mm -hmm. ending qualified immunity fixes that entire, that, all of that. So with, uh, with this is uh, Mr. Earl Lewis here. He's a family spokesperson for William Chapman. William Chapman was killed by the police in uh, Portsmouth, Virginia in 2015. Okay. Um, he was actually able to, uh, he's also a veteran, he was actually able to get a conviction um, out of that officer, which you probably haven't heard about, which is one of the reasons why we existed. So we, uh, like I said, we, he was able, to, he fought it all up to the Supreme Court. He got two and a half years, and they was Stephen Rankin. But that officer actually did kill somebody prior to. And I'll let him speak his piece on that. Yeah. Um, but if we could, like I said, get, something like this to be a blueprint of, of how to get justice with all these other unjustified cases of police brutality. No, I mean, what happened with this video? He killed somebody in 2011. Okay. Crazy. He killed him April the 23rd. He shot him 11 times. Now, he was from another country, so he shot him. Right? Guys like my comrades here that's over in Afghanistan, okay, that country, right, shut up that zone to the police out of the country. Okay. Yet it's still went all the way up to the state police, went all the way up to Hillary Clinton, right? This is an international situation. He sit him down for about three years. He sit down at the desk. Okay. Everybody said he was all right. April 22nd, 2015, yeah. he killed my cousin. He shot him in the head. So, uh, now, that being said, okay, as a veteran, Willing to die for my country, 13 years, infantry. How do you think it made me feel? Right. Now, with that being said, being a firefighter, EMT, for 20 more years, how do you think that made me feel? Yep. See, see, people try to blame it on Black Lives Matter or that's just one incident. No, sir, it's not. It's real. Until society realizes. But see, because they let that policeman right, sit down in the desk, he made him leave, he put his hand out like this, well, I'm just gonna get a, I'm just gonna get a medal, right? I'm gonna get a ministry of leave. Death job, gonna, yeah. Right, so that's right. what it was. So you have to basically, you know, go at it hands on. Yep. And people like myself, I've been traveling around the country, talking to mothers. When you're in a room with 20 mothers who's crying at the same time, it's a reality check. You know, so these are my friends. Literally, because I started by myself. You know, and as a veteran, guess what? I believe in something in the middle. Okay? Now, also being an African American male, I believe in Black Lives Matter. Because when nobody else listened to me, this man right here listened to me. See? And that's the difference. And at the end of the day, especially as a veteran, should I basically, if I can go to war, okay, and die for my country, how can I come back to America? So you can kill my cousin, exactly. shoot him in the head, and shoot him in the heart, and handcuff him. And handcuff at the same time. Yes, sir. Seth won't say the dead before. It's, it, it's real. It's so real. And I've been fighting this since 2015. You know, and that's why I stand these guys on that. Because ain't nobody that's going to show up. Everybody's going to say, I'm going to eat chicken. I love it. It is real. Okay? That's why I'm out here. Thank you for being out here. Doing this for and I'm sorry, I didn't catch your first name. Earl Lewis. Earl. And, you, and it was William as your William Chapman. If you look at William Chapman, 
Like if it was in Virginia, you will be surprised. And that was in Virginia? Yes. Yeah. That's one of those cases that, that goes without notice. Um, I said he's one of the reasons we started four years ago. And uh, India Kager, India Kager, who was killed by Virginia Beach SWAT team, they were executing a warrant on her boyfriend, and her child was in the back seat. So she was also a veteran and was killed. Um, Matthew Russian, he's in jail right now for uh, he's autistic black male, and he's serving 10 years or a 50 year sentence on a non fatal car accident. Um, and like I said, this is all 757. Like right now we're in 804, but this is just issues just that we, right. And like I said, mm -hmm. it's some stuff that doesn't catch the nationals because, you know, sometimes people just don't stand up around here like that. But we just, you know, we appreciate you coming out here, like I said, letting us at least share our stories. And we were putting hope in you. It's like we're hoping for a better tomorrow. Thank you. And I appreciate you bringing us out, bringing me out here. And, and bro, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate what all y'all are doing. I mean, you've been, you've been fighting this fight for five years now. And it, straight. it's something that, yeah, straight. Right. Straight five I mean, years. Straight fight. Before yeah. May. East Coast to East Coast. Yes. You know, because I realized that something was wrong. I was just basically going back doing my own thing. Yep. Telling my family, and the alpha male, I took over my family. I took over my neighborhood and my family. Yep. So, you know, that's the whole thing. But nobody see, see the good story, the positive. You know? and, I mean, these guys, guess what? We'll come to the death of anybody. No white thing, no black thing. As a matter of fact, I didn't make it a white and black thing. That man made an individual choice. Yep. But until we cleaned up the police department, for them good cops, we had to come to work, go home to their family, we still going to have a bad police department. <laughs> yeah, we're going to tell them to clean up and, and train them. Training, training, training. Uh -huh. If I see police reform, how come do? nobody else can see well, an increasing number of people are seeing it. I, I talk to people of all different walks of life around the country. And where a few years ago, I would hear a lot of people go, well, yeah, but doesn't but don't all lives matter? And I would say, yes, and that's what they're saying. If you would listen to them, they're not saying all lives don't matter. They're not saying black lives matter only or that black lives matter more than anyone else's yes. life. They're saying, yeah, they're saying also. And that unlike many of those other lives, we are seeing it play out that in the eyes of the law, very often black lives do not matter. And that is what the point of the whole movement is. And here's the thing, right now the media is giving a lot of attention to this. They're not giving it attention because they want this to get fixed. They're giving it attention because it's suffering theater. They want nice images of black people suffering mm -hmm. so that they can push for the same politicians to get elected that caused that suffering in the first place. It is not to serve you. It is not to serve any of us. It is continued theater for the purpose of continued infringement and oppression upon you and your communities. The very second that this conversation shifts from we're gonna protest in the streets and shifts to we want to be able to defend ourselves. We want to be able to own whatever arm we want. We want to end the war on drugs. We want to have our own decision making in, in community policing instead of having the federal government decide it. All of a sudden, that attention is going to get shut off. It's going to get shifted to riots. It's going to get mm -hmm. shifted to antifa. It's going to get shifted to you know whatever other boogeyman they can create right. instead of addressing what you are actually out here. Right. Right. And that's why it's important that you're leveraging it while you have the attention. Because I'm telling you, the first time that you're actually getting effective and that change happens, all of a sudden, you're not as important. It has to shift to whatever the next thing is that they want to keep people right. scared of. And right now what they're trying to do is keep white America scared of you. Mm -hmm. And the very second they can't portray you as something to be scared of, this now it's a problem. Say, first but, of all, right, sir, my eyes are just as green as yours. <laughs> you know, when it really comes down to a DNA, you're all the same. Absolutely. Until everybody realized that, mm -hmm. okay, the original. This is it. You know, this is it. And that's why it would take me a lifetime before I decide I would kill you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm telling you is real, real talk. Because at the end of the day, we are human beings. We all connected. Okay? We all connected. And that's what society is looking at. We all connect. Right. Okay? So why would I kill you? I look in your eyes. Your eyes green too. My eyes green too. So I'm gonna think about that. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Need to think about we're a human race. Absolutely, we're all one. Right? So when they say black lives matter, once we basically consider the human race, that matters. We have to get there. Yeah. But it takes a man like yourself. Right? Jim, you started here. Ball is here. Right? I rest my kids. Are you kidding me? Thank you for sharing your story. I greatly appreciate it. I appreciate everything that you're doing and I will continue to do to fight for this. Thank you. That means a lot.
So, like I said, if anyone had any questions about policy or anything else, I'm happy but, to answer anything you have. Uh, I have a couple if you're willing to. I'm with the outlet news to share if you're willing to answer a couple questions. Sure, absolutely. I guess the first question that's relevant with this crowd we have here is that guns are no longer a black and white issue or even a red and blue issue. Do you think the Libertarian Party is in a unique position to take advantage of that and address sort of the issues that the Republicans and Democrats are ignoring as far as gun policy? Absolutely. We're the only party that has been consistent when it comes to everyone's right to keep and bear arms. The Republicans and their slush fund group, the NRA, like to pretend that they're the group for gun rights. But we've seen most gun control laws, in fact, every gun control law that's on the book has been passed with the help of Republicans. And often it was Republicans who were, who were at the, the leading the charge for those, gun, for those gun control laws. Every single gun control law that is on the books happened with the support of the NRA. So the people who are being portrayed by corporate media as being the friend of gun owners, we can patently see that's not true. Donald Trump himself, he talks a, a great game occasionally on guns, but then he's pushing for bump stock bans, he's pushing for suppressor bans, he's pushing for, as he puts it, taking the guns first and then due process later. He's pushing for all of that. It is only the Libertarian Party who for nearly 50 years now, since our inception, has been pushing for an abolition of all gun laws and the enforcement of the Second Amendment as written that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Shall period. not. Not unless this or unless that, but it shall not be infringed. We're the only ones that have been consistent on that. So civil rights and gun rights don't need to preclude one another. Gun rights are civil rights, and civil rights are best enforced through gun rights. Uh, in the, what was it, almost 60 years ago, in the midst of, uh, 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 of, 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 of a meltdown between, between different communities, we saw the Black Panthers were able to get together and walk into the California State House because they had open carry. What was the first thing that happened after that? Ronald Reagan and the California legislature passed the, I believe it's called the Mulford Act, which ended open carry. And then they immediately started infringing even further upon the rights of black people in California. So before they could infringe upon their rights, they had to take away their ability to defend themselves. So it is, they are, not only are they not mutually exclusive, they are intrinsically tied together. Now, I know one thing with gun control is a lot of this isn't a federal issue. Here in Virginia, it's a state issue. It was forced to the state house this January. It's probably gonna be pushed through next January. If elected, how would a Jorgensen administration handle some of these issues that maybe not aren't on a federal level? How could you help if elected? Well, first of all, even though a lot of the state laws, they are taking their cues from how things are classified by the ATF. Well, if the ATF's gone, they're going to have to come up with their own classifications. And if we're able to show at the federal level the immediate and profound benefit that the American people will have in being able to defend themselves, not just uh, in, in terms of civil rights and in their, their protection of their right to keep and bear arms, but from the fact that their communities will be safer because it won't just be the police and criminals who own guns in, in many of these communities where they're currently illegal. When we do that and change it at the federal level, and and also have federal police uh, and federal law and stuff enforcement stop uh, working with the states to uh, enforce their uh, state gun laws. Not only will it be harder to enforce the gun laws in the first place, but the American people will see the immediate benefit of the ending of the gun laws and the, and the relaxing of gun laws at both the federal and state level, which will lead uh, naturally lead people to want furthering of that, to continue that trend towards ending the war on guns in our time. Okay, oh. Jorgensen administration gets elected. How do you start the process of dismantling ATF, drug enforcement agencies, and all the alphabet soup agencies that, as you pointed out, kind of put their boots on the necks of people, black, white, everything in between? Well, the beauty of the fact that Congress has so abdicated their responsibility over the past few decades to the executive branch and the creation of one regulatory agency after the next and giving them nearly unlimited regulatory authority is that that can simply be undone by Joe when she comes into office. Uh, we also have all sorts of precedent that the president can hire and fire as they as they wish, uh, absent the cabinet level. If they if they appoint someone to a cabinet position, they have to get approval. But uh, Joe Jorgensen can go in and fire everyone in the ATF and just not hire anyone else. And then we can we can pressure Congress to make that permanent by by repealing those laws that led to the ATF in the first place. But in the meantime, she can just fire. Them. Yeah, I did that. And 
I guess, final question. I'm sorry. But as you pointed out, you have the Democratic Party that makes good lip service to the Black Lives Matters movement, but then appoints Kamala Harris as their vice presidential candidate. Yeah. You have the Republican Party that makes a good lip service effort to gun, to gun groups, but then passes bump stock bans. And then you look at protests like this, or at the January rally, or the July 4th rally, where you have gun groups, Black Lives Matter groups, groups from across the political aisle coming together for a common cause. Why is it that the two parties we have keep ignoring that, and why would the Libertarians and your ticket be different if we've been burned by both sides before? They ignore it because it doesn't fit within the theater and the narrative that they've created. Republicans and Democrats have so little between them, so little difference between them, that they have to create theater. And they have to keep everyone nice and separated and fighting each other so that we don't take a step back and say, wait a second, they're all working together. They're all in on it. They're all, they're all getting us to fight each other, but then they're having cocktails together and working on the next you know, round of, of omnibus laws and, and legislation and, and regulations that they're going to pass. They're in on it. The Republican Party is one and the same and in on it together. And so they like have to create that division. Something like this completely destroys their narrative. Because mm -hmm. they want to be able to ask someone, are you someone who supports gun rights or are you someone who supports Black Lives Matter? They want to be able to create this divide and put everyone on this side, put one group on this side and one group on this side and have everyone fighting in order, because it's divide and conquer. Right. If we can all be fighting against each other, if you and I are fighting each other, then we can't step back and say, oh, they all suck. Right. We're sitting here fighting each other, and, and not only that, but then what happens is their threat that if you don't vote for Joe Biden, if you don't vote for me, you're going to get Donald Trump. Right. You, don't Donald, me, you ain't black. You ain't black. You, you, right. you, you ain't black. That's yeah. where he lost me, period. Yeah. Donald Trump says, I like if, a good you challenge. Vote, if you don't vote for me, you get Donald Trump. What they're saying is, if you don't vote for me, you're going to get this other guy that I work with every day to screw you over and right. infringe upon you and oppress you and take more of your power and your wealth and your freedoms from you every single day. But... That narrative falls apart the second that we aren't fighting each other mm -hmm. and that we're looking at the fact that they're all working together and that we don't care which one of them wins. We don't want either one of them to win. That's when that ends, and that's why they not only do everything they can to foster a divide between us. Have, uh, Thank you for your time, Mr. Crowley. Thank you. So um, I guess you already spoke on part of it, but I was going to ask you about the dismantling, if you were in agreement with dismantling like corrupt police forces, like Virginia Beach is one of the most corrupt. Would you agree uh, with, like I said, the full disclosure, sentences, and review boards, that would allow the citizens to speak out against what was going on. And if a department has systematic racism so deeply within that it has to be dismantled, Just would dismantle you completely? dismantle completely? I would support that happening. Now, at the federal level, it's not going to be a good idea for the federal government to come in and say this department needs to be dismantled until, unless we have enough sufficient number of civil rights violations that it now is a federal level, yes. a federal issue, because it's a constitutional rights violation. Right. But in general, it is best for this to be left to communities to look like, what do you want? What do you, you know, I love that you have 757 because it's, it's your actual immediate community. What does the 757 area code and the people living it, what, and even better, the communities within there, what do you want your policing and your first response to look like? And the best way to do that is to remove the federal government. So what I will say again, going back to qualified immunity, the thing that empowers bad policing and in, and in turn punishes good policing is the fact that they're not held accountable. Mm -hmm. You literally cannot hold them accountable. We just had a situation where a federal judge detailed a, a case of a, a black man who was driving home to my state, South Carolina, and a police officer stopped him because he wanted to give him a hard time because he was a black man in a nice car. And so he, he pulled him over, and I, I, I want to say it was, he gave this excuse that it had something to do with, oh, uh, your uh, license plate was, uh, was obstructed. And the video shows clearly, clearly that it wasn't. I think it was the license plate. Whatever it was, the video showed that it was a bogus reason to pull him over. Then he said, uh, we got a call that said that you're transporting drugs, which was a lie. So the, the man, and I forget his name, uh, the driver, agreed to having his car searched. So the cop starts ripping his car apart, searching it, like actually doing damage to the vehicle. When that didn't work, he brought a canine officer, a, a canine in, and had him, had the, the canine sniff the car, didn't find anything, left the guy on the side of the road with $5,000 of damage to his car. He had to put his car back together and go to the nearest, uh, I guess, body shop or whatever. It turned out it was, I think, $4,800 in damage. When he went to sue the police department, that federal judge had to say, 
I have to give qualified immunity because that's what that's what the, their the, job. The, that's my job, and that's what the precedent is. But he gave the most scathing uh, uh, indictment of that officer in saying that I have to give you immunity, but immunity is not vindication, and you were wrong. And this is a problem, a systemic problem that's going on, and it's why qualified immunity needs to end. So you literally have judges saying qualified immunity needs to end and until it ends I have to keep giving you qualified immunity because that's my job. Qualified immunity dismantles the system that empowers police and it empowers those communities to be able to take back their policing because now they can sue the cops and then they can go to the state and say hey listen you want to stop getting sued here are the things we want. We want community review boards. We want the state to decentralize how policing happens so that we can decide what our police department looks like. We want police officers to only come from our community instead of having them bus in from hours away where they don't feel any kind of connection to the community. We want these things to happen and, and you may you may want only some of those things. That's up to y'all. That's up to your community to decide that and that starts with them being held accountable and having a financial disincentive to continue the, the, the plan. They're never going to stop this unless it hurts their pocketbook. So we make it hurt their pocketbook and now the policies change. Okay, so last, hold on, one more. We got uh, legalization of marijuana. Uh, we, we're ending up, we are legalizing all drugs. Boom! I, that's my, that's big. I'm, I, mm, uh. Hey, I just like I got a question for you. So, uh, we've heard a lot of your, a lot of your statements on, on the police and dismantling their all, also reformation in the government. I just want to ask you about your tie today, um, and also how you feel about CNN boys or the dreaded word Boogaloo boys, which I'm the Boogaloo boy. How do you feel about CNN boys? Yeah, Revolution Two, Electric CNN. No, uh, listen, the Boogaloo boys are doing an incredible service to make sure that, like I said before, peace and protest remain peaceful. <laughs> The, there is a mischaracterization, yes, sir. many mischaracterizations yes, sir. of people in your movement. Yes, sir. One is that you're a bunch of white nationalists, yeah. which is weird because I thought this was a Black Lives Matter rally and yet you're I know, you right, right, yeah, big yeah. points. So that, we just debunked that there. And then the other misconception is that you're trying to pick a fight. And yet, there's a bunch of police officers here and I haven't heard a single shot yet. Yeah. So the, you have, the, 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 the movement has been very clear. Yes, sir. This very. is a deterrence. This is saying, we have our rights, we have the right to defend ourselves, and we will defend it against anyone who tries to take it from us. Point blank period. That's not a threat, that's not violence. Yeah, that, is making, no that is setting ex expectations. Yes, sir. If you infringe, you will regret it. Yes, sir. That is the yeah. purpose of the movement. Man, I, I respect that. And, and last question, um, how do you feel about our offer to put Joe Jordison on the debate stage? Because <laughs> We've we've had, we've offered it. We've got teams put together that would gladly put Judge Orgerson on the debate stage. And I spoke with one of your uh, I spoke with your security man about eating after this. We're willing to pay for your dinner as well and maybe talk if we can. Okay. But we're willing to put Judge Orgerson on the debate stage. We're willing to give her an escort, um, even if she's approved to be on the debate stage. But we're still willing to escort her. How do you feel about that? I personally have no problem with that. I would defer to her on what she wants to. Yeah. That's her, her body, her choice. Obviously. Uh, so I, I would defer to her on that. But I, I will say we're, we're going. To, the CPD, the Commission on Presidential Debates, is scared to death of us being on that debate. Yeah, because you would destroy both parties. You put Joe Jorgensen between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, two, yeah. two men who can barely form a coherent sentence between them. <laughs> Donald Trump, who you know, he promised he was going to be, he's going to drain the swamp, and instead he became the king of the swamp creatures. Yeah, he became the swamp. Multi, he, can't, he is the swamp. He's the king of the swamp. It's a thing our forefathers warned us about. He's exactly what they warned us about. A crony becoming the head of the thing. Uh, and then you have Joe Biden, who's, who's behind every bad policy to come out of D.C. for the past 50 plus years when he's not busy making women and children uncomfortable in front of everyone. And uh, you put between them Joe Jorgensen, who will just completely dismantle them and break down how they've created these problems and how our common sense libertarian solutions will fix it. It's a no brainer. The American people will realize not only is voting libertarian not aided, but thrown away. But it's it's the only way not to throw away your vote. Throwing your vote away is voting for the same people who show up every four years and go, hey, it's me again. Yep. The guy who Tyranny. created all these problems and made them worse. But if you vote for me this time, mm -hmm. I'm totally going to fix it. Guys, I'm totally going to fix it this time. And frankly, if you don't vote for me, you're going to get this guy that I work with every day to screw you over. So it's one of us, and you have mm -hmm. to choose. And you have to choose which one of us is, is slightly less terrible. And, and, and the American people seeing that right in front of them in the debates will completely destroy that narrative. They are Horrified. Yeah, that's right. And I'll, I'll end on this last question. Sorry, guys. How do you feel about pedophilia as far as the repercussions of that? Because that's something the movement wants to see absolute destruction of because we're tired of seeing pedophilia prevalent in our government. And we're tired of seeing people go to prison for 20 years on a drug charge, which you're, you're talking about uh, ending the war on drugs. But then, but then go to prison for pedophilia for eight months, nine months, ten months, when really the death penalty should be for pedophilia. You should put pedophiles in a wood chipper. So let me ask you, how do you feel about 
um, the, the war on pedophilia and how will your, um, when Joe Jorgensen becomes president and you as vice president, how will y'all combat pedophilia and how will you uh, make the repercussions of pedophilia bigger? So I get asked a lot, how will you combat pedophilia? The number one thing we do is we keep the pedophiles out of DC. Yep. We're seeing with Epstein and Jelaine Maxwell and all these things that are going on, we're seeing there's a lot more pedophiles than we thought there were, and they're in some incredible positions of power. And that actually kind of makes sense, because what is pedophilia but someone exerting their power over someone right. yes, who sir. can't defend themselves right. against it and who didn't consent to it, who can't consent to it? What are the people in government doing to us every day? Yeah, they're doing the same. So it is just another version of that. It is the most disgusting version Very. I can think of. What chip goes burr? Yeah, exactly. What chip goes burr? Listen, I'm against the death penalty. Uh, when I hear that uh, pedophiles get killed in prison, I, you, you want to guess how many tears I shed over it? None. Yeah. None. So All right, thank you, Mr. Cohen. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Hmm? Mr. I've got a question. Sure. Right? You're talking about qualified immunity, right? And that's supposed to somehow end the systemic racism in our black neighborhoods. Okay. No. Uh, ending qualified immunity holds bad police accountable. Right. But you understand that it's going to take four, eight, twelve years to hold that cop accountable because the police unions, all they do is just along in, in, in the judicial system, right? I think there will initially be some fighting, but after the first few major landmark cases where entire police departments had to disband. But again, you're talking 8, 10, 15 years for those I, I don't cases. Think it, I don't think necessarily it's 8 to 10 to 15 years, but... I mean, we're looking at five years on, on a police officer that was charged, what, uh, down in... Uh, of course, I'm drawing a blank now. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Ferguson, right? Five, five years. Yeah. Okay, so you win qualified immunity, they got to wait five years to end the unconstitutional laws that are pressing their rights. Yeah, well, and again, because it, they've got to go through that five years of suing the police department, suing the police union, yeah. and in the meantime, during that five years, they're still being oppressed, they're still being shot, they're still being arrested. Well, and we use the federal government to go after people that are infringing upon the constitutional rights of the people. Let me be clear of that. I'm not saying okay, that. How, how does well, the federal sir, government? Sir, you asked me a question, and I'm, I'd like to have a chance to answer. So any qualified immunity is one of many things that we will be doing. We will also be using the Department of Justice as a Department of Actual Justice. The purpose of the Department of Justice originally was to deal with the people in government that were infringing upon the rights of others. And then at some point it became this federal law enforcement agency that basically is the, the you know, trickle down police brutality starting at the Fed. Uh, that's, we will take it back to what its roots were, was actually going after abusive officials and holding them responsible, including abusive police officers. So it, it, in addition to that, and ending qualified immunity, we also end those types of practices like no-knock raids. We end the mandatory minimum sentencing. We end the war on drugs. We end the militarization of the police, which is not just the military surplus equipment they get, but the training they get to go along with that equipment. That's something that isn't talked about a lot. We talk about the fact that you know uh, police departments have tanks and MRAPs and and drones and all this other stuff that, why do they even have this? What we don't talk about is when they get that stuff, military contractors come in and train them in how to use it. So they're getting an increasingly militant, uh, uh, they're being trained by the same people who trained the military who's fighting enemy combatants overseas. And then with that training and the mindset that comes with it, they're then going into our communities and enforcing the laws. So the ways that you can combat this, it's a holistic approach. It's not just holding them accountable when they do abusive things. It's also dismantling the training and the equipment that they're getting that leads to that. It's also dismantling the laws that they're enforcing to uh, reduce the number of interactions between the police and the public in the first place. And then it's, it's putting the power back in the hands of communities to decide what they want their police departments to look like. And I will say again that when you see those first few landmark lawsuits that completely bankrupt entire police departments and put them out of existence, it's going to be the state capitals that are going to the community saying, okay, fine, here, you can have this, we can't afford it. But the majority of those laws are state control. Federal government has no say over a lot of the state laws, right? Not over the laws, unless, again, the law itself infringes upon constitutional rights. But Which the there are thousands of laws that infringe on our constitutional rights, and those right? things would get challenged in court. Those but again, you're, you're, how, how long do they stay in court? I mean, I mean, we have Supreme Court stuff that's still been there for 12 years. And I can appreciate that, but I don't think anyone could reasonably tell you that there is an instant solution to this, or even a quick or simple solution. What we can do is look at the problems that are being caused, and how they're being caused, and address those problems. And it might not happen the very second that those things get implemented. It can't happen. It's a systemic thing. It took 
decades and centuries to get to where we are now, and it could potentially take years to get to where we want to go. But if we're at least moving in the right direction and ending and reducing the harm in the meantime, we're at least headed in where we need to go. Listen, if anyone comes up to you, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch your, catch your name. My name's Kurt Santini. Kurt, if anyone comes up to you, Kurt, and says, I have a plan to end systemic racism and police brutality on day one, do not listen to me, because there is no such thing. No, you're So we right. have to look at this thing as a holistic approach. We have to look at the entire body of how this has happened. We have to look at the history of it, and we have to look at what the policies and laws are that are in place, and then we end those things. And right, then most we, of these guys will be dead by the time we get to that, right? I, I don't no, think that's... Well, yeah, I don't think that's... No, no I mean, you're, you're talking decades I, no, on, no. on that kind of reform. Uh, not necessarily. I think, first of all, if, you, if, we elect, if we elect enough libertarians, it'll happen even more quickly than that. But it needs to happen more on the state level as well, not just the federal. Well, that's why we are fighting to get libertarians elected on the state level as well. We have uh, people in the, uh, in the Virginia Libertarian Party. Party. We are. We're, I've actually been here promoting down ballot libertarian candidates. I was in Manassas yesterday doing exactly that. Do you have a governor candidate yet? Uh, do we have a governor candidate in Virginia? No, we don't have the one in Virginia, unfortunately. Uh, what would you like to see out of a governor candidate in Virginia specifically? Yes. Uh, I would like to see a governor candidate that's going to do at the state level what we're doing at the federal level. That is dismantling oppressive and infringing policies at the state level. So something like a constitutional a Virginia constitutional revision, securing the constitutional rights, getting rid of the qualified immunity, setting term limits in the constitution. All of those things are things. And then starting a study to remove those laws that are currently on the books that infringe on the rights of the people. That's I support all of that. But that has to happen at the state level, like you said. My name's Kurt Santini. I'm running for governor. Oh, okay. all right. Well. And everything I just said to you is what I stand for. Because I stand for these people right here. I feel their oppression. I know their oppression. And uh, I don't like the idea of federal governments saying they're going to take care of it. Because the reality of it is when Joe gets elected, if she gets elected, she's got to fight all them other people that are already there. Absolutely. Look what's happening right now. We're divided between Democrat and Republican. In that division, nothing's getting done. What do you think it's going to be like with a libertarian against both of the parties? It's going to be very difficult to get anything done, if anything at all. Well, at the executive level, not so much. At the at the legislative level, absolutely. But there's a lot of stuff that can happen at the federal executive level because Congress is so. Active how many how many libertarians do we currently have in Congress or something? Really? There's one right now, but again, at the executive level, if Joe gets into to, to the White House, there's a tremendous number of things that she can do before we even say word number one to the legislature. Because for the past several decades, they've just been handing off their authority in the form of creating one regulatory agency after the next. So Joe going in can immediately start dismantling all of that. I apologize for the questions. It just it was coming out to me like all this was going to happen so quick for them, and we're, we no, are looking at no, 10, 20 years minimum. Well, I, I don't know about 10, 20 years, but uh, I hope no one thinks I was saying this happens in a day or two. It, it happens. The policies can be changed in a matter of days, in a matter of weeks, but in terms of actual like implementation and how it plays out, that can obviously take longer. I mean, the, it's, it's, the last major Virginia constitutional revision was 1970s. Yeah. It took four years for them to do that revision. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, constitutional amendment's about the hardest thing you can do. Right. But, yeah. but yeah. that's that's the one thing that needs to be done the most at this point, right? We've had so many laws that have watered down our constitutional rights, mm -hmm. just decade after decade, century after century at this point, and they just use those laws as precedent to create a new one. Yep. And then when we have division between Black Lives Matter and the Second Amendment movement and whatever other thing that they can bring up, mm -hmm. That division is meant to keep us away from the laws that they're creating. We're not looking at the laws that they're creating. We're looking at the division. We're fighting amongst each other. Yep, yep. That's what I was just talking about. They, they keep us divided against each other so we don't take a step back and see what they're doing to us together, working in concert every single day. Right. So even I really you appreciate your time. My question. Thank you. Even with Thank that change you were saying, man, even BLF 757 said change may take seven days, five years, or seven centuries, but change is going to come. It's got to so, start. Man, we're going to be here. We've got to be the ones to start it. Our ancestors help us get this far, so we got to be the ones to pass it on. But hopefully, our kids won't be fighting this fight no more but we got to start somewhere so right. we got appreciate y'all coming out here and like I said giving us another choice and like I said it takes a lot to even put yourself out there to run for candidate period I mean it's people try to dig up and do everything except for actually listen yeah yeah yeah, 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 so, yeah absolutely. we appreciate you coming we're trying to get out here for sunset so we want to keep it too so I'm here I'm here I'm here I'm here sure I got a year before I graduate high school. I love the liberty. Oh wow! I, I love it. I like your ideas. 
I want to get more involved. How can I spread the message? So there are two things that you can do. Uh, actually, I guess three things that you can do even before you're out of high school. Uh, is that you can uh, sign up. Now, I'm trying to think with the under 18, I don't know if there's any um, And that I don't know. But here's what you can do. And, and the, the people in charge of that people can tell you. Uh, if you go to Joe20, that's J. And by the way, anyone who wants to help, this is an open question for anyone who wants to help. If you go to Joe20, J O 20.com. Uh, there's a volunteer form that you can fill out. We're building a grassroots army for human liberty, and uh, we'd love to have you join. Another thing you can do is uh, join your state and local Libertarian Party affiliates, because that's where it's happening, on the ground every single day in the grassroots. We have local and state LP affiliate people today here uh, helping us with this, uh, and, and that's that's where things are happening at the grassroots level every single day, and they will be able to give you the tools and help to equip you to help push the message of liberty to your family and your friends and your loved ones and colleagues in your communities and neighborhoods and everything else. Again, because you're under 18, there may be limitations on what you can do. They would know what those limitations are far better than me and be able to still work with you on what you can do. So, and thank you for your support. What was your name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay. I see a lot of people that don't want to uh, vote for Joe Biden, and a lot of people that don't want to vote for Donald Trump. Uh -huh. So I think we have a lot of people out here that might not realize that they may be their tent. What are you doing to increase your presence on social media? Because we don't necessarily need the mainstream media to get your message out. Yeah, that's actually our main thrust has been, we've just been twofold. Number one is social media, and number two is getting in front of people. And so I've been to, uh, I don't even remember how many now, uh, Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, I've spoken to gun rights groups. I've spoken to people uh, across the political spectrum, in person and online. Uh, our social media game uh, is on a completely different level than any other previous uh, libertarian campaign. Um, it is our main thrust. Uh, and then also now what we're doing is, uh, Joe's actually finishing up her leg of the bus tour where she's going to communities across the country and meeting not just with the uh, with the people that come out and other supporters, but also trying to meet with different coalitions and groups in those local communities. So we leave a lasting impact there and plant seeds with people in those communities to let them know what it is we're pushing to the grassroots level. I'm going to be doing the same starting in on Wednesday. I'm starting in Cincinnati, working my way through the western states until I end in, uh, oh, really? in Seattle, doing the same thing. Going from city to city, meeting with uh, supporters, people that are interested to hear what we have to say, and also meeting with local coalition groups and local media as well to, to, to get our message out there. Uh, we are not waiting for the, the mainstream media to come and get us. We're not even waiting for the, 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 I guess, alternative media to come and get us. We are putting our message out there front and center. Thank you. What's your name? I really feel like you need to start speaking to more of the young people, like in their 20s. That's my. That's where we need to hit because if you want a new choice, that's who's going to want it the most. That has been mainly who I've. And you know, I think I've never heard of y'all, and I would like to hear more. So um, I'll look you up. Is there something online that we could actually? start listening to what your views are like is there what is the website or whatever uh, our website have? is joe20.com uh, jo20.com and all of our social media is on there I have a YouTube page where I answer almost every question that could possibly be asked of a politician uh, if anyone here wants to visit my YouTube uh, if you look up Spike Cohen on YouTube uh, it has it, we break it down into little snippets uh, where I've done in different interviews where I've been asked different questions and I give you know kind of long form answers to each of those questions so uh, just even just going to the YouTube will probably answer pretty much almost any policy question that, that that has been asked. There's a lot of stuff on there. We're adding more every day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I agree with you 100 percent that that it is young people. It is it is. I'm a I'm an old millennial. I'm 38. It is the millennial and, and Gen Z generations that are more left behind than than the current generations that are alive right now. They are experiencing way more acutely that the system that was set up it's broken. is broken. Not just broken. It was made not just not for them. It was made against them. It was made to take from them for the benefit of the relative handful of, of, of incredibly powerful and cynical and well-heeled political billionaire cronies who own the politicians that put these policies in place specifically to rob all of us. And it's the youth who don't already have that established generational uh, uh, you know, wealth and finances that are realizing that we're all screwed at this point unless we change this. So I, I agree with you 100%. Thank you very Thank much. You. I have a quick question, sir. Sure. Um, 
since it directly applies to you, what would you tell the people that are hearing things such as voting third party is throwing your vote away? Sorry, yeah, so, um, and I think I, I just mentioned this before, but uh, throwing your vote away is voting for the same people who created the whole mess that led to everyone protesting in the first place. Democrats and Republicans, Republicans and Democrats, the Republican Party works together every single day to screw us all over, especially people of color, poor, and other marginalized communities, but really all of us. And so if I come up to you and I say, I know that I've created all the problems that you're facing right now, but if you don't vote for me, you're going to get this other guy over here that I work with every day to also make your life miserable. And But if you vote for this other choice over here who has had nothing to do with the harm that you're facing and is actually proposing ending all of that harm, you're throwing your vote away because you have to vote for either one of us. It's a con. It's it's, it's gaslighting and uh, and it's just a, it's an easily debunked lie. If everyone who is being presented as your only viable option are all of your enemies or all of the people who have made your life so difficult yeah, to begin with and have created such infringements and oppression against you in the first place, then it's only voting for someone else would, would be the only way not to throw your vote away. Voting Republican or Democrat is voting for someone else. So, if people feel that um, voting for things such as libertarianism might be a waste, I understand what you're saying. Like we, I mean, everybody knows the two party and the Republican. We all know they they cahoots and all this yeah. other stuff. But how would you convince somebody that voting for a lesser popularity out of the two? How would you convince them that it's not throwing it away? Because again, if, if the if the two I guess more popular parties are both terrible and are almost indiscernible from one each other. So like if I don't assign a name or a party to a set of policies and I say this politician did this, 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 and this, and they're all bad things. And based on what I said they did, you don't know if I'm talking about Donald Trump or Joe Biden, then it doesn't matter which of them. It doesn't matter if, there's, if, the, if, if our party uh, might not get as many votes because if either the Republicans or Democrats win, you lose anyway. So that is voting, throwing, it's, not, it's actually worse than throwing your vote away. Throwing your vote away is writing nothing on a, 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 a vote uh, on a ballot and just throwing it in the trash. When you vote for your oppressors, you're actually voting against yourself. That's worse than throwing your vote away. So it's, it's worse than a waste. It's actually harm being done against yourself. So voting libertarian or, or and, and voting third party is a vote against that system of harm that your other two choices are presenting. It, it is the only vote that isn't a waste. So how do we, uh, other than word of mouth, how are you and uh, Ms. Jurgensen and all the other libertarians going about um, getting out there more? Um, what do you think is appealing about your party uh, other than screw the other guys? These are good questions. Um, so, as I was saying before, we, we're doing a ton of social media stuff. We have viral videos that are coming out every day, uh, we have or every week. Um, we are going on bus tours around the country, talking to communities like this uh, all over the country. Uh, I will have visited by the by the time election day comes around. I will have visited just over 40 states uh, and many places in those states. We're not just going to big cities. So, like I was in Richmond today, but earlier today I was in Gore, Virginia, which is like up in the mountains. We're going to communities large and small, speaking to people across the political spectrum, everyday Americans from every single walk of life. Um, and we are taking our message directly to the people. And that's what other libertarians up and down the ballot, people running for Senate and Congress and everything else, uh, are, are going through into their communities and doing. Your question as to what is appealing about us, I invite you to go to lp.org slash platform, and you can actually read our entire platform. And our platform, the, I guess the 10-second the, the explanation our platform is that you own yourself, you own your life and your body, you own your labor, and you own your property. And the Republicans and Democrats work every single day to infringe upon your self-ownership and to oppress you and tell you what to do with your life and your body and to even take your life and your body and to take your property and to put you in a cage that they control you. And libertarians are on your side every single day fighting to end that system of harm. And we're the only ones doing that. So do you feel like um, y'all have a fair shot when the big thing about it is mainly just doing whatever we can to get 45 out? Do y'all feel like that gives y'all an unfair shot to we're just going to vote for the other person 
that has the best chance to win. No one but Republicans have, a, in fact, no one has a fair shot in, in, in elections. The Republican and Democrat parties have gamed the system so that if you are a Republican or Democrat, you are automatically on the ballot and taxpayers, each one of you that are watching this that pay taxes, you actually are being forced to pay for Donald Trump and Joe Biden's presidential election campaign to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. But when I or any other third party person runs for that same office, we don't get any money. We don't want your money. But we don't get any federal funding. We don't get any taxpayer money. What we get is we have to spend we have to spend most of the year fighting to just even get on all 50 state ballots. So it's not a fair shake at all. But we are spreading our message out there that if you are against Donald Trump, name the things that you don't like about Donald Trump. And I guarantee you, whether you're talking about a policy or whether you're talking about something he has said or something he has done, there is something as bad or equally bad as Joe Biden and vice versa. If you're saying something you hate about Joe Joe Biden, you say the exact same thing about Donald Trump. The only way that we're going to end this 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 constant ever worse choices for president is to show that we're not going to just keep picking from the same Republican candidates that they hand us because we're going to keep getting worse and worse choices. We all got to take off. So vote Libertarian because we're the only ones that don't suck. We just want to take this like this. Oh no, tap this in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah.